Yes, I'm sure they are smiling and loud after what happened last Sunday. MJ, first of all, Leash, let's go there. Do you think if you were playing, you could have made a difference? Um, I suppose every player would like to think he could have made a difference, but I suppose the other way to look at it is what stage. If I had it come on, if we were five or six points down, you know, it's hard mm -hmm. to make an impression there. And the guys that were playing, you know, at two or three occasions in the game, they brought it back to nearly two or three points. So you'd like to be coming on at that stage, but you can't fault the lads for, for effort. We didn't really turn up as regards, say, the basic skills in the day, but they fought hard anyway. In terms of the actual selection of the team, you were named on the starting 15, but then you were dropped subsequently. How did you find that out? Um, I spoke with Justin before before Sunday, and that seemed to be the thing. I I didn't watch it, but um, parents and friends and stuff were saying, you know, there was a big hoo-ha over whether I was playing or not mm. on the on the pre-match analysis. But uh, I spoke to him, and I, I didn't expect to start because I didn't play well enough the previous two games to start. But I would have hoped and would have liked to get on some stage. Same as any player, you're there, you're tugged out, you want to play. Like that's yeah. the, the be and all of it. Now you tweeted that you were disillusioned. <laughs> yeah. uh, have you left the panel as suggested? No, no, I haven't left the panel. I, a journalist phoned me up from the one of the local papers and he asked me the same and uh, my initial response was uh, yeah. I said yeah I have left the panel. And I could hear a bit of a silence. I said he was gone for a notepad for something and I said no I haven't <laughs> left it. I mean you can't, you can't play in team sports if you're gonna, like you can be disappointed. That was the thing. I, I, I don't see why any player wouldn't be disappointed with not playing because of all the subs of the mm. 24 that were there, the lads that didn't get on would be disappointed because you want to play, you want to make an impact and you like to think you can. But um, no, you couldn't, you couldn't drop off a panel because of that. If you could, if you were like that, you wouldn't make them. I think, I think as a player, like if you were a manager and a player wasn't disappointed, you didn't play. Like you, you know, you you don't really want him about the squad. Absolutely. You know, it's good to have a lad disappointed. And were you surprised at the reaction to your tweet yeah. as such? I mean, even the president of GA was involved <laughs> in it as well. Hugely surprised. I wish I had got paid for it. <laughs> I'm actually tweeting here in my pocket at the moment. But, I, I um, thought you would have learned from Rooney and Ryan Giggs in these guys, no? Yeah, well, they're getting paid for it. That's the difference. <laughs> but don't tweet until you cross your bread, if you don't mind, MJ. The fact that, M that MJ tweeted as such, it, it, it's fair <coughs> game for comment because it's now in the public domain. Isn't that true? It is. And I mean, MJ is entitled to tweet 24-7 if he chooses. He's an amateur sportsman, so he can do what he like in that regard. And what he tweeted was pretty inconsequential, really. The word disillusioned. Of course you're going to be disillusioned. But we've discussed this off air, and I'm kind of, maybe it's a generational thing that I don't really get the idea of Twitter because it's essentially texting into the ether and anyone can pick it up, uh, interpret it, manipulate it, whatever hap where they, they choose. I had this conversation with a rugby international earlier in the year where he took umbrage with a newspaper uh, taking up a tweet where he said he was injured for the weekend, paper picked it up and he said but I wasn't tweeting for the paper. Oh. I wasn't. I was tweeting for my friends, and I suppose my advice to MJ would be text them. You know, <laughs> because you don't know once it's out there as a tweet. As a tweet, you don't know what's going to happen. It. Now, when you see today that John Clark has left the down panel, and it is a lot of it is not the main reason to be fair to him, but a lot of it is the criticism that's out there on the internet sites and on the on the mm. Twitter. What's your reaction to that? I think some of the message boards out there and GA message boards are vicious, and I think they're absolutely appalling. I'm not surprised to hear a player like John Clark has made that decision. You see some of the abuse people take, you know, not just players, but officials, journalists. I just, I just think it's appalling. And there's, there seems to be no comeback. There doesn't seem to be any legal retribution you can take against these message boards, which I think is shocking. Well, you can't. As you say, you put it into the ether. You're, you're allowing yourself open to it. Like, the, the biggest thing I find that the dislike I'd have with, say, abuse you get is when your parents are hearing it in the stands because that's mm. the thing that hurts your family directly. Oh. But other than that, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. Like, mm. There's a lot of people uh. not happy with what I said and they're allowed and they're entitled to their own opinion but the only reason I ever spoke to any journalist about it was just to get the point across to clarify, mm. say, I hadn't dropped off the panel and the biggest thing that annoyed me, I've no problem with the Sunday game mentioning it because they're entitled to do that if I mm. put it out there but like, you know, they started to say I refuse to come on Mm. A couple of columns on the internet and a couple of um, actual articles said that, and that started to deny me then because I don't mind, say, you know what happened. I, I kind of laughed that off and thought it was a bit harmless. But the fact that the media just sensationalised it then and just ran with their own story on the back of it that annoyed me a bit because it made me look. And uh, would it put you off? <coughs> Tweeting? No, not at all. I have to admit now, if I was putting up one, I'd probably, you know, if I was writing a one, say the day after or that, I was kind of looking at it going, well, sure, they're obviously going to be watching this. And I was amazed at how many journalists and sports editors started to follow my Twitter straight away but after. But do you not understand, MJ, that, you know, it's well known that you as a sportsman are tweeting and you're playing a big game in Croke Park, you don't come on, five subs are used, you're not one of them. 
So inevitably, that's the way the media works. Now, it's worked that way in England oh. with all the big soccer players now. I'm not saying you're in the <coughs> same boat, but it, it is f open, open season once it's out there. And I'm surprised that you say you will continue to tweet. Does Justin McNulty, for example, does he have a view on it? Or? Yeah, I spoke to Justin about it and he laughed it off as well. Like You have to, you have to really just take a look at it at face value. Mm. It's my opinion. You have your opinion. Pat has his, Marty has his. Mm. So we mightn't agree with Marty's a lot more than most people's. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can't... Nothing new in that, <laughs> yeah. You can't stop people from having an opinion. And mm. my opinion wasn't against Leash, it wasn't against Justin. I agree with his decision not to start me. I put, if we had won the game, nothing would be made of this. If I tweeted the same thing, nothing would have come of it. But you can accept but that it, it can, it's open to any interpretation. Oh, yeah, it's open. Let, let, let's, let's move on, because we have another topic to discuss, and that's umpires. One of your favourite topics, Pat Absolutely. McElhaney. Yeah. Last Sunday, of course, I know your brother was manager of me, there was a major call made. When you saw it, do you think the umpires made the right call? Well, uh, you know, it wasn't the umpires who made the right call because the umpires don't have the authority to call a square ball. Um, I think um, uh, Sil Doyle um, went with all the correct procedures. Basically, it, uh, Sil Doyle felt himself from the position that he was picking up, he felt it was a square ball. The young umpire on the right hand side of Sil Doyle's son, he's only 21 years of age, that's his fourth year in the championship list now, good young umpire and believe it or not, like if you look at the video closely, he's actually going for the green flag, he's yeah. quite, his decision is that's a goal and you know, the much maligned people, you know, some of the abuse that, the, that these two umpires got last week was, was incorrect because people hadn't all the facts on the table. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you look at the um, the, that umpire's reaction, he was actually given the goal, but Sil um, in his position said no he thought that was a square ball so you know we had we do have a number of training sessions on this we brought all the umpires in give them training they've done exams and there's a lot of effort gone into umpiring it this year and the protocol was followed exactly there was a disagreement between the referee and the two umpires still went in pulled the, the, the umpire from the white flag over to the green flag and they had an open discussion and if you look at that actual clip there was no rush there was no panic mm. it was saying listen but, let's but, let's but, get to a decision here. But is there now a requirement for a video referee? Would you be in favour of a video referee? Not unless we have used all the, 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 the rules that's available to us. Two years ago, Marty, we had a rule change for the National League that said you, once the ball left the player's foot out the field, you're quite entitled to enter the goal-scoring area. Number one, it increased the number of goals that were scored in the National League. Number two, it was highly supported by referees because it made my job and all my yeah, colleagues' jobs a lot easier. Last Sunday's controversy would not have happened. The controversy that I was involved with last year with the square the ball for Kildare would not have happened. And, you know, we, we make a stick to beat our own back with. And, oh. and, uh, and, you know, that failed at Congress two years ago. The same Congress that um, we ran with a, the, the old style fisted pass in the National League and worked very well. And the next thing that threw is a young puppy from that Congress, the underhanded pass right, that caused which controversy. <coughs> Very briefly, MJ, would you be in favour of a video oh, referee? 100 percent. Yeah, like as I was saying to the boys beforehand, you get hear a lot of people saying it's the rub of the green, but you can't you can't do that when it's a Leinster final and it's loud. And a lot of people are as well are saying it's karma for me. You can't do that when you put so much into it to be unjustly done. When you when there is a solution, I think mm. is very very backward. Okay, well, gentlemen, stay with us. After the break, we ask, what's the best way for the GA? This is a great buzz in and around the camp. Like, um, this was the one thing when you're, I know I'm not going to be playing now, there'll be less pressure and I can have an order to crack with the lads that's ass legging them and winding them up as well. But, like, some people like to go cold turkey in total, total just rehabilitation away from the t every, everything else, like just do it on the run. But thankfully the lads have asked me to come in and do a walk, like, and maybe if you see something on the line, you can get the message into the lads, something that they mightn't see when they're playing, like so. The start of the season was good for me, uh, a good enough league campaign. It was going fairly well until that uh, we played league match day and above in Salt Hill and Galway. And obviously after about 15 minutes did, did uh, the crew shift for the second time in, in three years. So since then I got an operation, this was it's eight weeks ago now, and it's just rehab, rehab for, for the last few weeks. I did it before, I, I know the, the road back, or that's, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. So well, since I did it the last time, I've uh, won two All-Irelands, lost an All-Ireland in the Sigerson, so 
if God is good and if I win half as much as that after this, I'll be, I'll be going well. Frustrating I watch around the line, but people forget it had been there. But as I said earlier on, what can you do on the drive on? All roads used to climbing on four weeks. The situation in the country has affected every aspect of life, and the GA is no different. As immigration rates rise, rural clubs have been particularly badly hit. One such club is Turnafulla in West Limerick. This is Tornafulla, a rural village in West Limerick, um, population roughly 750 people. This is uh, the, the centre of the village where uh, Otay Mulcahy's pub is uh, closed at the moment. There are three pubs in the village. Um, there is a school, a shop, church, um, but the focal point of the, of the uh, village would be the GA pitch. It would be the, everything more, more or less revolve around the GA. Tuna Fulla Club, I mean, for the last number of years, we'll go back 10 years ago, we were doing fairly well. We won the Intermediate Championship in 2003. And um, 2005, we uh, went to a county quarter final. We were senior in 2009, relegated to the Intermediate for 2010, and down to Junior A for uh, this year. In Tuna Fulla, for the, for the last 10 or 15 years, the, um, the main I suppose the work around here was in the construction industry and since that has more or less fallen apart in the last couple of years a lot of them have immigrated to uh, England, America, Australia. You must be somewhere in Down through the years, there's been a number of, uh, of legends as far as GA is concerned in Tona Fulla. Um, there's one man in particular, and uh, he's still holding at the tender age of 50 years. Gerald Moroni is his name, and uh, he's, he's, he's one of the, uh, the stalwarts of Tour GA. I started following him with him 14 in 1973. I came onto the senior panel here in 78, 79. I was a sub in the, in the county senior final in 79. Immigration started the heatest in from about 2009. I'd say from that, that team that played in 2004, I'd say there was at least eight, nine, ten of them that went to Australia. We came from senior to junior in two years because we lost the bulk of that senior team like away to foreign shores. But um, that's just devastating, of course. But um, you know, you have to carry on. We'll bring in young fellows and we'll keep it going and we'll try and do our best as best as we can. We've over 250 players have gone uh, abroad this year, mainly to the UK and Australia. There was never a greater emphasis on the community and the volunteer, because we need volunteers. Sometimes during the Celtic Tiger, it was difficult to get volunteers because people hadn't time. That's our, our challenge as an organisation, to, to, to get these people to come into clubs and to stay in clubs. This club will always keep going. They always keep going. There's a, there's a great community spirit here, like, and, you know, it's all GA clubs, like, to, to your parish, like, you'll do everything in your power to keep it going, you know, like, oh, we'll keep it going, all right? Yeah, with God's help, yeah. There are many Turner Fullers in the country, a very interesting example there. MJ, Pat and Vincent are still with us, and we're going to look at some of the wider issues that the recession has thrown up for the GA, particularly that of unemployment. Vincent, you wrote recently about Pat Fitzgerald, the CEO of the Munster Council's idea about what the GA could be doing for the GA people in terms of gaining employment. Tell us what that idea was. Well, Pat came up with an idea basically that you redirect funds that are set aside for ground development and put them into some kind of a a, a jobs initiative where you subsidize uh, employers who take up unemployed club players. And what I liked about the idea was it was spoke, focused on club players. Um, the GPA has some fantastic initiatives for inter-county players, but club players are being, uh, clubs are being devastated by the recession. And, and it struck me that there are probably holes in Pat's plan, and I'm sure employment law might have difficulties with it. But he was the first senior GA official that, to me, 
acknowledge that there's a massive crisis for the GA there. And I mean, there's the ESRI figures in February said a thousand people a week are leaving this country, and I think the GA themselves reckon about a quarter of those are GA players. Pat, you're a businessman, you employ a lot of people. If there was such an initiative from the GA, would you be in favour of it? Well, I think, you know, you have to have the work for the people. Um, I think the big problem that the GA are currently having in the next three months is all those student players, the lads that's 18, 19, 20, going to third level education, and there's just no work there for them. And the young lads have got to go, you know, some of them have to pay their own college fees, so they've got to go to places like America now where they can play football. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a good idea. Like, I mean, it's probably Vincent says, you know, the other county players do get uh, reasonably well looked after. You know, even Gypsum Industries, where I work, we have Martin Comerford works with us, Paul Finley. Um, um, Mark O'Reilly played cornerback, yeah. so you know the, the county player is reasonably well looked after. There's no question about that. Yes, the club player, and particularly this year, and uh, the summer work does just no summer work there. MJ, have you been affected by the country and what's yeah, been happening? I am um, just on the, the Tullerone there. Like my home club was very similar to that, and it has been very much so deflated by the, the recession because I was leaving Ireland, I suppose, about a year and a half ago after I came back from Hong Kong from travelling to play football because work was so hard to find, like I came out of college with a media degree and there's just no work for someone like that. I, for a GA player you don't have time to, you know, give all your hours to your yeah. career, so it's tough like that. And even just to, I suppose, put in on what Pat said, I found it, it it's changed a lot. The, the inter-county player isn't being looked after, not because no one cares anymore, but just because who do you pick? Who like? Why should you be looked after more so than this guy? And oh. especially when this guy might have five years' experience in the mm. industry, I don't mm. want to look after you. I, th I think though, uh, MG, it opens a lot of doors. Like oh, you know, it does, I, yeah. Even for me, from um, refereeing over this past number of years, like it opens a lot of doors for any man. It has to be said. And Pat Daly in Cook Park has done a fantastic <coughs> job uh, over the years in terms of coaching. But is there, is there, is there an opportunity there for both club and inter-county players to to uh, go into coaching, that the GA would provide more coaching opportunities? Well, what I can't understand, Marty, is why any unemployed county hurler or footballer is not automatically put onto a register of GA coaches. I think that should be an automatic thing. I think a lot of the GPA initiatives are absolutely top class, but we should try and use that model for club players as well. And I think, you know, it's it's not unreasonable to think that it's an extraordinary time we're at at the moment, so extraordinary measures. And I would say put a levy on all kinds of GA income and use that levy as a central fund for club players. Yeah, okay. but Vincent, you, you know, you've got to balance the books here. You know, like if the Lancer Council have so many coaches, you look at the crowds for uh, Crow Park last Sunday, you know, five or six years ago, that was a sellout game. Oh. And last Sunday, like, only 40,000 people. And the Lancer Council like, have got to balance the books at the end of the day. And there's only so many coaches that they can afford. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure we're going to come back to, to that. Uh, thanks indeed to, for all of your contributions. We're going to turn our <coughs> attention to the weekend's games now. And the big one in hurling is the meeting of Munster champions Waterford and Limerick. Waterford are hot favourites, but then they were in 2007 as well. Whoops, the sumo wrestling has started before you even get going here. Donald O'Grady plays this ball in towards Brian Begley. Runs inside, Donald Ryan. Oh, he's got another! Great move, a shot in the seat. What a goal, what a start by Limerick! This is inside, McGraw misses, and Malofi puts it into the back of the net. Oh, what a goal! He's done it again! is the taker. He's been given the instructions. He's followed the instructions. Begley has it. Here's a chance. He can bury Waterford. Limerick win by five points. Yes, indeed. Great memories there from 2007. Uh, Vincent, Limerick, winners of Division 2. Can they beat Waterford? Well, after their last year last year, I think they've been looking at June 12 as a massive day for them. So they'll be hugely motivated. But the history suggests Division 2 hurling. It's very difficult to beat a good Division 1 hurling team in Championship. And Waterford are a very good team. Wexford last night, one point victory over mm. Kilkenny in the Under-21 Championship. How significant is that considering Saturday night's big game? Well, I've spoken to a few of the Wexford people uh, today and the county's electrified by what happened there last week or, or last night. And bear in mind, they, they avoided relegation when it looked like they were gone. They had a very good win over Antrim. They feel they're going to give Kilkenny a rattle. But remember, Kilkenny were top of Division 1 for mm. all their problems. MJ, let me bring you from Leinster to Connacht uh, to a match that your man here is going to be refereeing. Leitrim against Roscommon. Who do you fancy there? Um, I'd like to see Leitrim win it. Um, I think they could be 
they could be the upset purely because they have nothing to fear going into it. And I suppose most common people won't like hearing me say it, but I suppose they had their day in the sun last year, and that's obviously going to stand to them. And maybe that's what could be Leitrim's downfall. But I'd like to see Leitrim do it just to keep the the underdog. I know you're going to be refereeing in Carrick and Chan. It's a beautiful ground. There's going to be a wonderful atmosphere there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's been a while there since I've been down there. I think the days of Jerry Flanagan and and. Uh, Mickey Quinn and, and mm. uh, all them boys, Seamus Quinn, and, and uh, since I've been down, it's been a while since I've been down there, but looking forward to it, you know, it's a nice uh, tight-knit pitch down there, the fans are right up beside you, so I'm sure they'll have a few words for me. Go <coughs> back to your own province, uh, Pat, I'm sure they will have a few words for That aside, Kevin and Gustav Nagal in your own province, what's the word up in Ulster? Well, the word is, you know, Kevin is rebuilding, you know, I mean, uh, Val Andrews has basically stripped it down, he's gone with his, uh, you know, the one that on the 21 Ulster final two years ago, won it la uh, this year. Um, and you know, competed, got got turned over big time by Galway. But that's the team he's looking. He's eight new debutants, um, three players who who um, are only who played in the last championship mm. match. So they'll find it difficult. Donny Gall will come in there, and I'm hoping Donny Gall go a little bit more offensive because yeah. I'm, I'm not really I don't really like looking at the sale But I think Jimmy McGuinness and, and Donny Gall will come a little bit more offensive. Okay, MJ. I know you like one words on tweets, so here's one word. Answers I want: Wexford against Westmeath. I could be controversial, Mary. I could get you in trouble. <laughs> um, I'll go for Wexford purely because uh, a couple of good friends of mine play with them. So. One word. Wexford? Wexford. Loud against Carlo. One word. Carlo. OK, there you have it. <laughs> so a busy weekend again, and you can see it all on RTE. On Saturday, we are live in Wexford Park, and coverage starts at 22.7.